I V M. I want to thank Intel for supporting our show. We're all loving working from home, but let's be honest, there are complications. For example, getting help from IT folks if your PC is down can be challenging because you can't just walk up to them anymore. Well, you'll be happy to hear that I have a solution for you, the Intel vPro platform. The platform comes packed with Intel Active Management technology that lets your IT teams remotely manage your systems and fix the problems without having to go to them. So it means more time getting your work done and less time spent on getting support. Visit intel.in slash more with vpro, that's vpro, to discover how you can do more of what you want and less of what you don't. If you're listening on the IVM Podcast Android app, click the link that's visible to you now. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. Today we have with us a very special guest, uh, Madhuvanti Srinivasan. Madhuvanti is a journalist who extensively follows Turkey, um, especially in Turkish language sources. So we can get a almost a, a first-hand account of really what is happening in possibly the most interesting country in the Middle East. Um, welcome Madhuvanti to All Things Policy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, so over the course of the next half an hour or so, Aditya and I will be discussing um, West Asia or the Middle East with Madhavanti. We'll be talking a great deal about how exactly Turkey functions within, really what makes Turkey tick. And finally, we will be discussing what Turkey is up to in the Indian subcontinent, its relationships with Pakistan, Bangladesh, and of course, India. Um, so let's get straight to it. Madhavanti, our first question to you would be, um, help us understand the internal politics of Turkey a little better. Now, as, a, as an out outsider looking in, relying mostly on English media news sources, I see some broad similarities. There is a, a very strong nationalist tendency in Turkey. Uh, there is a charismatic um, president comparable to our uh, prime minister. And of course, you have a very, very devoted fan base to the prime minister uh, in India and to the pr- president in Turkey. But there's also much deeper similarities that you were talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Right. Um, it's a very interesting question. And in fact, uh, this is, I think, one aspect that often goes unexplored in terms of the similarities between Turkey and India. Uh, as you mentioned, both uh, Narendra Modi and Recep Tayyip Erdogan are extremely charismatic leaders um, with fan bases that are fiercely committed and dedicated to their cause and to their leadership. And also in terms of um, the way opposition systems work in both the countries um, and the way uh, there is some sort of a crackdown on press and on independent press in both the countries is, I think, um, something that is very similar. If there is a possible difference, it could only be more so in uh, the degree or and the degree at which um, all of these seems to be functioning. So uh, if you look at the way the main opposition party of Turkey, which is the CHP, and the way in which they swept um, the mayoral elections last year in the three main cities of Turkey, uh, which include Istanbul, Ankara and Izmir, is very similar to how the BJP was decimated in Delhi last year. Where, and, you know, you had an Arvind Kejriwal coming up with an overwhelming majority in the elections. So I think opposition and the way systems function and the way opposition is also demonized to a great extent. And, you know, the kind of discourse and conversations that happen between the ruling party and the opposition is something that's very similar between Turkey and India. And if you look at the way the press functions in both the countries, I think you do have a good, fair number of independent journalists within the country and outside the country, both in Turkey and India, who are trying to be very critical, are trying to question what is happening and are trying to bring the real picture of, you know, what is really happening in both the countries. But you do also have a very dedicated section of the media which tows the government line, which is all praises for the president and the prime minister with no questions asked on the decisions taken and are always of the opinion that whatever the government does is the best and uh, whatever the opposition or whatever the opposition or the questions raised um, against the government, how do I put this? 
in fact i would say that the section of media or the pro establishment media in both turkey as well as india are extremely dedicated to the leadership to the government with no question asked and are very quick to deem uh, questions raised and those critical of the government as enemies of the state so i think uh, there are a lot of similarities between the two countries often unexplored but if there is a difference between the two i think it is more in the case of the degree at which these uh, systems are taking place interesting that that's a very uh, that's a very uh, elegant macro picture that you that you've drawn of how turkey works overall um but let's kind of dive a little deeper into the details right what really motivates support for president erdogan you we you briefly alluded to a kind of nationalist base but what kind of historical experience uh, what kind of historical belief is, is it based on and i think um the parallel also extends in in certain other ways where for example the founding father of turkey mustafa kemal atatürk um is not as highly regarded today as as he was during his own day um that i think is an interesting parallel to the way that india's first prime minister Mr Jawaharlal Nehru uh, is not as kindly regarded today as he was in his own day Absolutely so I started following Turkey very closely post 2011 and in fact uh, let's be very honest I could ask this question to both you guys as well apart from Erdogan is there any other prime minister or president you recognize from Turkey No nope. So that's precisely the point I think Erdogan has undoubtedly been one of the most charismatic uh presidents prime ministers he's been both a prime minister and the president so i think he has been one of the most um, charismatic leaders in turkey and that charisma is something that has really drawn a lot of people towards him like all credit needs to be given to that and also the the success with which his first term really went but you know turkey did enjoy a great deal of economic success and you know there was a lot of importance that was being extended to turkey because they were growing to be more and more important in the context of geopolitics and also 2011 was the time when the middle east and the entire region was undergoing a great change so you know economic success and um you know the charisma with which uh, erdogan connects to people in turkey is something that greatly contributed to his popularity and this is apart from the nationalist agenda where people believe that turks and muslims you know the majority of the country rather needs to be prioritized not believing much in the secular credentials and by listening to this there could often be a lot of confusion even among the listeners that whether are we talking about turkey or are we talking about india because that is how similar both the countries are in all these contexts so i think that is something that has really contributed uh, to uh, erdogan's popularity which is at shaky grounds at the moment for the past one or two years uh, and even i mean it's even it, it is on shaky grounds right now but i think his charisma and the success the economic success that he brought to turkey has greatly contributed and having said that i think his undoing of a lot of policies of mustafa kemal pasha has not really changed the way people look at mustafa kemal pasha that is the greater turkish nation still regards atatürk as the father of the nation and as somebody who has done a lot of good for the nation but there is definitely a conscious uh, undoing of a lot of um, atatürk's values Uh, and ideals in turkey which is again very similar to the way as you mentioned nehru is looked in india and the way the bjp government is undoing a lot of nehru's policies in the country uh, madhavanti uh, i want to ask you uh, to orient our listeners uh, can you tell us about the basic philosophical differences between the akp and say the chp the party that used to previously dominate uh, turkish politics absolutely if you look i think one of the biggest uh differences between the two is definitely the value of secularism of course there are allegations against former regimes as well where you know the kurds were persecuted the armenians were persecuted so there are a lot of such allegations as well but i think secularism on the whole uh, in terms of let me give you an instance there was a time when headscarves yeah. were banned in turkey where women were discouraged to wear headscarves because 
they didn't you know mustafa kemal pasha didn't kind of believe you know in sort of he or he rather sort of believed in europeanizing westernizing turkey in fact you know you will see a lot of photographs of you know mustafa kemal pasha dancing with a woman in public you can't even imagine anybody today doing that and then you have an erdogan who is coming out and who talks about how you know social media websites like netflix and twitter are not suitable for our country and how he should be having some sort of control over social media websites and their consumption in turkey so i think secularism and the kind of ideals of you know erstwhile turkey is something that has greatly changed that is turkey for the longest time i know of people in india who for the longest time didn't even know that turkish uh, that turkey was a secular country you know they always regarded it to be a country where islam was the state religion which is not the case turkey as per their constitution is a secular country i mean of course sunni muslims at the end of the day are the majority but constitutionally they still continue to be a secular country and this is a contribution of ataturk and of the erstwhile turkish leaders but th- this i mean is now just becoming a part of you know it's just like a rubber stamp now you know it's just part of the constitution but when you look at the way things have changed you know when the akp came into power there have been a lot of um, this entire undoing of head scarves uh the head scarf ban and you know of course i mean the debate also comes down to choices of women etc i mean that's a second thing but the undoing and how secularism as a value continues to erode in turkey is one of the biggest differences between erdogan and between ataturk's turkey what is interesting to me is is the fact that in a lot of ways ataturk himself his policies his emphasis on secularism uh, can be construed in a way as as being uh, a kind of vision of a new turkey uh, that was independent in some senses of, of the older kind of ottoman legacy absolutely. as it were absolutely absolutely the one really seems to be leaning quite heavily into the idea that modern turkey is an inheritor of the ottoman legacy not merely in terms of how um, its domestic politics should be structured with with this kind of as you said authoritarian system uh, that leans on uh, on religious um, on religious vote, vote banks but also seems to influence the way that turkey conducts its, its foreign policy right the way that turkey sees its influence or as it were its, its rightful um, duty to protect various countries in the region so um can can you tell us a bit about that madhavanti absolutely in fact um, a lot of analysts would always mention that you know turkey's foreign policy previously um even when the akp was in power probably it was more gradual after erdogan came to power but turkey's foreign policy was um, never on the basis of sunnis and shias before which is a pattern that is becoming very visible in the way co- turkey is conducting its foreign policy today and today there is some sort of consensus where you feel that you know a lot of countries believe that you know turkey and even turkey for itself also believes that you know they are the protector of the muslim world and they have certain responsibility and um, you know this extension of the ottoman rhetoric that you know you were all our brothers and it is our responsibility to you know protect your is something that really uh, plays out in terms of turkey's conduct as far as palestine is concerned and as far as libya is concerned and even as far as how syria is concerned uh, but particularly in the context of palestine and uh, libya in fact one of the biggest justifications given for uh, turkey's intervention in libya is that they are our ottoman brothers or they are our brothers from the times of the ottomans and it is our responsibility um you know to go and protect them and you know to go and stand you know shoulder shoulder by shoulder with them and fight the enemy so i think that ottoman rhetoric is uniform the sunni muslim rhetoric is also very uniform though you'll never hear of persecution of shias per se so which is very common in countries like afghanistan where you often hear about you know the hazara community being persecuted simply because they are shias or the shia community being persecuted in bahrain or shias being persecuted in saudi arabia you you'll never hear stories of those kinds from turkey but and they've not been very militant in terms of um, their sunni rhetoric as well but if you look at the way they have extended support in syria 
in Yemen, etc. I think, uh, and of course, their opposition to Assad, uh, Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian president as well, you've seen that there is some sort of um, a trend in Turkish interventions that they do look at Sunni groups and supporting them. So the Ottoman rhetoric and the Sunni rhetoric um, are introductions within Turkish foreign policy that have become all the more evident after the AKP and particularly after Erdogan came to power. Uh, what's really interesting is that the the way this rhetoric is being used, right? Uh, uh, we do we see Turkey involved in these foreign military adventures, like you said, in Syria, Yemen, Libya. Uh, some of these are kind of understandable. I you understand why uh, the Turks would be worried about Syria? You know, they're concerned about the PKK and so on. It's a neighboring country. But why are the Turks involved, for example, in Libya? And the, do security concerns? justify the extent of their involvement in Syria? Or is something else driving these? Is, is it domestic politics? Again, very interesting question, because as you mentioned, um, their involvement and intervention in Syria is still very justified with their security concerns, that, that they are concerned about Syria and even northern Iraq, for that matter, being used as um, safe havens by the PKK to wage a war against Turkey and there has been a conflict mode between the PKK and the Turkish government, the Turkish state since the 1980s. So their intervention in Syria and and their airstrikes in northern Iraq is still easy to justify. But when it look, I mean, when you look at Libya, I think uh, though I do extensively read about Libya, I've not quite seen a justification on Turkey's part. Apart from these rhetorics and apart from, of course, the oil that uh, Libya is home to, but apart from all of these things, I've not quite seen a very valid justification that has convinced me why Turkey has to be a part of um, the Libyan conflict. And, you know, they could have rather uh, not intervened the way they have, because I think Turkey is the most overtly, I mean, is has the most overt intervention in Libya at the moment. I mean, if you see a UAE, you know, it's all behind the curtains. Everybody knows that they do have a role to play, but not the way the Turks have been doing, where you have ministers going and visiting. I mean, I do understand from the point of view of the Turks that, oh, you know, they are kind of showing the world that we are here to stay and, you know, we will support our allies. But Turkey's intervention in Libya is something that, I mean, the justification has not surely convinced me. And as you mentioned about uh, domestic political uh, vote banks and, you know, making them happy, I think Erdogan does greatly uh, use these interventions in his advantage. He does use these foreign interventions in his advantage when he talks about Syria. When he talks about the intervention in Syria, he mentions about how he's protecting the country. When he talks about his intervention in Libya, he's talking about standing with allies, standing with fellow Muslims, and standing with brothers from the times of the Ottoman. When you're talking about Palestine, you know, and his rhetoric against the, I mean, the looming Israeli annexation and when the U.S. recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and how Jerusalem is the red line. You know, these are very easy statements or these are statements that can literally give you a leverage at a time when possibly your, you know, domestic policies aren't working, there is discontent. You know, using such rhetorics, which are very emotional, you know, which are very emotionally appealing to the Turkish public, is something that gives you a lot of leverage and Erdogan and the AKP has has learned it very well. So every time there is trouble, you know, they'll always talk about the PKK or they'll associate an opposition party with the PKK and say that these two are associated with each other and, you know, they are against Turkey. So the entire anti-national rhetoric that uh, perpetuates in India is also a rhetoric that perpetuates in Turkey just in different contexts. And these are then used you know, to kind of push a leverage and possibly uh, gain some sort of domestic approval. So how well does this narrative actually work, Madhavanti? Like you, you talked about how uh, the Turkish economy isn't doing so well. Um, are, are all these adventures really supported by the Turkish public to a great degree? Or, or is it really just a, a small and dedicated base of the AKP that, that these actions are meant to play for? What really is the Turkish public's mood regarding uh, the one's foreign adventures? As you mentioned, that small, dedicated community, you know, that 
that surely supports the AKP and the Erdogan, of course, don't question what he is doing in Syria and in Libya. But you do have some people who are critical and who do believe that, you know, at a time when your economy is not doing well, you know, such expensive adventures, because, you know, interventions in countries like Libya and Syria also do involve a lot of money. So, you know, you have people questioning the government by saying that, you know, are we in a position where we can spend that kind of money, you know, where we can spend that kind of money and intervene in these countries? Is it required? And as I've mentioned previously as well, you do have a lot of informal surveys that keep going in and out about how Turkish public looks at, you know, these foreign interventions and the numbers keep fluctuating. So you can't quite understand whether the Turkish public is supporting Erdogan. So it's never, you know, a full-fledged majority. You'll never have the entire country supporting Erdogan over a foreign intervention. That's never the case. That There is a significant community that does question, that does remain critical uh, of Turkey's foreign interventions. So apart from the ones who are dedicatedly very supportive to Erdogan, you do have people who do question them and who are very critical of these foreign interventions and question the very need for Turkey to be intervening in all these countries. That's an interesting point. I mean, the the, the fact that despite all the AKP does, despite its its army of like um, social media warriors who, let me tell you, are like fairly well known uh, in all sections of the internet. It's 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 quite fascinating to me that um, there are certain nationalist groups that are very well known on the internet. Turkish nationalists are very well known. Serbian nationalists are very well known. And of course, Indian nationalists are very well known on the internet. So once again, a parallel between both of our countries. But that brings me to another question that I wanted to ask you, um, Madhuanti, about um, the way that Turkey interacts with Indians just generally. What really does Turkey think about the subcontinent more generally, which includes uh, our neighbors, of course, Pakistan and Bangladesh? And what does Turkey really think of India? What direction do you see uh, these relationships heading towards in the years to come? As far as South Asia is concerned, I think Turkey is still making its way in terms of uh, the way it interacts with the region. They are involved to a certain extent in Afghanistan and the entire Afghan conflict and uh, negotiations with the Taliban and the government. And as I had mentioned, they have extremely close, very warm ties with Pakistan. And you do have a lot of cultural exchange happening, a lot of Pakistani students who go on Turkish government scholarships to study. And I mean, there is a lot of cooperation that happens between Pakistan and Turkey. And Turks look at Pakistan as you know, a brotherly nation of sorts, also very close to Bangladesh, not as much as what Pakistan is, I mean, not as close as what they are to Pakistan, but definitely close to um, Bangladesh. As far as India is concerned, Turkey and India are two countries which have huge potential in terms of cooperation. And I think both the countries are misunderstood. Turkey is also misunderstood in India. India is also misunderstood by the Turks. Apart from the ones who do, I mean, who do know what they are saying, but there is a lot of misconceptions and there is a lot of um, misunderstandings regarding both the countries. And um, there are certain contentious issues as well in terms of Turkey's position on Kashmir and their support for Pakistan. But I think uh, things are diluting slightly and um, you are seeing that Turkey has started recognizing India as a very uh, important partner as far as the region is concerned. And um, I think I would foresee more conversations happening between the two countries. Turkey is also looking at establishing two more consulates in India. So there is an effort being made uh, for conversations to happen. But as I said, there are certain very traditional typical misunderstandings which are hampering the cooperation between the two countries. And one is definitely their proximity to Pakistan. What are the sort of misconceptions that Turks have about India? Very interesting again. So I think one very big um, misconception that they have about us is that um, I wouldn't say it's a misconception, but I think it's more of a concern. Uh, Turkey has Turks and Turkey in general are becoming a little vocal about how Muslims 
are being treated and uh, believe that you know there is the um, some sort of a second degree treatment that is being extended to muslims in india and they are very concerned and worried about it and the others are very how do i say these are very normal sort of misconceptions oh india is very dirty unclean etc etc those kind of misconceptions uh, which you do make and if you do have a conversation with the turks you know you can kind of change that but i think and you did see a lot of um, public discourse during uh, the attack on jamia millia islamia during the delhi riots this year a lot of turks coming out and talking about um you know what everything that is happening in india they've been very vocal about kashmir uh, a lot of conversations did happen over article 370 and its abrogation and i think turkey has been very vocal about all of those things and there are certain misconceptions but i think those are because there is fundamentally a lot of disinformation and uh, and i also believe that the misinformation and the misconceptions in turkey is also partly because india is not covered very extensively in turkey just like how turkey is not very extensively covered in india so the understanding of both the countries are not as good as what it should be so there are misconceptions the others are the general ones that you have you know the typical indian misconceptions about india being dirty cows this and that so but apart from that i think uh, simply because a lot of focus is not extended towards both the countries that is india in turkey and turkey in india it gives a lot of scope for misinformation which leads to a lot of misconceptions interesting so um i have i have one final question from you uh, madhavanti which i have received on special request from pranay kotesthane the head of research at takshashila and it is extremely serious so so please give us a very sincere answer uh, and that is um i have heard that turkish soap operas are really good which ones are worth watching uh, is it true that atogrul is good imran khan is a big fan and it's really big in pakistan one i think uh, it's a brilliant question by pranay i in fact uh, started getting very fascinated by turkey just because of soap operas and i started learning turkish by watching these uh, turkish soaps uh, <laughs> and i think my mother still today regrets my decision to start watching turkish uh, soaps but uh, having said that etrul uh, is yes very uh, popular in pakistan popular in india as well a lot of people have been watching a lot of people are extremely fascinated you know by the very similar words that are uh, used in both turkish as well as hindi slash urdu um, so you know that kind of gives that um, you know oh my god we are so connected with turkey sort of a feeling and uh, in all honesty i haven't watched it yet so i wouldn't quite recommend it uh, i end up watching a lot of romcoms and uh, the cheesy turkish soaps which i'm not quite sure if pranay will enjoy but uh, apart from that i think yes uh, etrul and turkish soap operas have ended up playing a huge role in turkey soft power push all across the country you won't believe i'm part of a facebook group which was watches turkish soaps with english subtitles so this was at a time when i just started learning turkish and i needed assistance and i would watch them with english subtitles hmm. and i've ended up making friends from all across the world so i have people right from south korea till latin america eastern europe uh, even a country like greece with whom turkey doesn't enjoy the best of relations hmm. Uh, a lot of south asians indians are growing very interested in turkish soap operas pakistanis have always been afghans in fact in afghanistan that transition from chunki saaz bhi kabhi bahut hi to turkish soap operas has been over the years <laughs> at a time when indian soap operas were extremely popular in afghanistan afghan uh, tv sets now have more fascination towards turkish soap operas iran iraq across the arab world you have turkish soap operas being translated into arabic and into multiple regional languages in fact um, i read the statistics recently that after the united states if there is a country that exports the most number of tv content across the world it is turkey so i think they have really pushed their case in terms of soap operas and um, estoril definitely is um, a game changer 
but there have also been a lot of other extremely good ones which i think unfortunately gets missed because of um, no english subtitles that that is so interesting um so very clearly Indians and Turks divided by a lack of knowledge about each other but united by politics and more importantly by the most enduring of all human forces soap operas um on that note thank you so much madhavanti for joining us uh, and thank you all for listening to all things policy if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network you can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila I N S T or our website Takshashila dot O R G dot in. I hope you enjoyed that show. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week: Paytm Money and Intel. So, been a really exciting week on the network this week. We've had some really cool stuff. My old friend Vivek Lad was on Storytellers and Storytellers. Definitely do check that out. On Saturday, said we had Ashwin Sanghi on Thursday's episode, and Saturday, myself did a cock and bull, just the two of us. That was fun as well. On Monday, do check that out. Masaba was on Advertising is Dead, which was another really, really strong episode from Varun. And on the sports front, both edges and sledges, football, football had some really fun episodes. As the football twaddle, do check those out as well. And if you haven't been paying attention and you haven't been listening to Smile India in these times, I don't know why you aren't. It's the most uplifting show that you could listen to. It's a short, bite-sized piece of really positive things that happen in India. Do definitely check that out. And with that, we hope to see you again next week. Namaskar, dear Bandhu. My name is Ashish Vidyarthi. These are truly challenging times, and in these times, we need hope. Do take time to listen to my podcast. begin the journey available on ivm podcast website app or wherever you listen to podcasts remember there is hope because this one life and we are alive